In the very first year of his papacy, Pope John Paul II planted a time bomb in the church that is not likely to go off until about 20 years from now. And I wrote that in 2003, so past 12 of those. Beginning in September 1979, he devoted 15 minutes of each weekly general audience over a five-year period to sustained, dense, and rigorous meditations on human sexuality. Reflecting on key biblical passages, the Pope began by wondering what it meant to Adam walking in the garden to discover that he was alone in an embodied self with no one with whom to converse and no one to share any of his reflections and no one to help him to know who he was. We don't discover that in a in solitude. There are ways to do it in solitude, but it's a long discipline. Um, he also, the Pope also asked what it meant to him, Carol Wojtyla, and the rest of us to be embodied selves. Theology of the body is what he called it after all. And you have to remember behind this that Christianity is the only one of the world's religions which believes in the resurrection of the body. It's not just the salvation of the soul. For a thousand years, Christians tended to emphasize that, and I think it unbalanced the church. And it only slowly got rectified that we're embodied souls. Both before and during the papal conclave that elected him, Cardinal Wojtyla had been working on these lectures, intended to, intending to use them in his teaching in Krakow, where Professor Buttiglione was at the time uh, studying with Wojtyla. He was unsatisfied with the reception of Pope Paul VI Humanae Vitae of 1968, and unsatisfied, too, with the state of the argument in the church, thinking that it did not go as far as it could in answering certain basic puzzlements that humans have about themselves. In particular, certain passages in the Bible about male and female, love and lust, matrimony and divorce are not transparent in their meaning and stirred Wojtyla's wonder. What on earth could they mean? To get to the bottom of the story that we are to ourselves, must we not go down more deeply into a philosophy of the human self, that is, the human subject? In the 129 public addresses that Pope John Paul II delivered over those five years, in four long sequences of the varying number of weeks, he went back to the Word of God to try to fathom the Creator's intentions in this puzzling work of His. The Pope began with Adam in his solitude, Adam walking alone as a species, neither vegetable nor mineral, neither God nor animal, and not an angel either. Adam stood alone in all creation, silent creation. He did not have the company of his own kind, neither could he procreate and so ensure the continuation of his species. He was, a point, he was in poignant solitude, a truly silent solitude. It was not, the Bible tells us, good. It lacked an essential 
apart. And so from Adam's flesh to underline the oneness of the human essence, God created Eve from his body. God created Eve. Now, Margaret Thatcher has a wonderful story about this. She went to her first meeting of the G8 as prime minister. And um, Monsieur Mitterrand, president, was uh, in the chair. The meeting was in France. And uh, he forgot to introduce her. And she was steaming, a little, <laughs> little black cloud above her head. And finally, he, oh, forgive me, he said in his best French manners, he said, uh, I forgot. I want to introduce to you the new Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, uh, Lady Thatcher. And he said, you know, uh, first God created Adam, and then he took from him a rib and made for him a helpmate. And I'm sure that Madam Prime Minister will be a great helpmate to our Well, if you think that calmed her, <laughs> you're wrong. So she contained herself, but when it came time to speak, she thanked President Mitterrand for his courtesy. <laughs> and, then, uh, and then said, we must read a different Bible in Great Britain. She said, in our Bible, it says, first God created Adam, and then learning from his mistakes, he <laughs> created Eve. <laughs> Nobody liked Lady Thatcher. <laughs> um, <laughs> he created Eve, not just woman, but a person with a name, face, shape, and personality. One inescapable point of this account is that the human being is two in one. Male and female, he created them in the beginning. To make man two in one was God's intention from even before time began. And if you don't think God has a sense of humor, uh, Imagine what it took to create human sexuality as we know it. Um, further, if the human being, being is made in the image of God, the second point the Bible insists upon, it is as male and female together. Something in our male and femaleness together pulls back the veil on what God is like. There's something about the mystery of God revealed in that. The distinctness of our being male and female is revelatory of God's own being and inner life in a way that is difficult to plumb. We human beings are not persons in the way an angel is. We are each embodied male or female. Nobody's born a person. You're born male or female. Not born an angel, in other words, but embodied. Each gender alone is incompletely human. We are made for the communion of male with female. Why then so soon did Adam and Eve become aware of their nakedness and filled with shame? Of course, this was after their sin. But that this shame is not due to their bodies or merely to their being naked is made plain by one glaring fact. Shame had no part in their original being. It is not of their essence. On the contrary, the shame arises only when Adam and Eve violate the will written into their natures by their creator. When they use each other to suit their own individual appetites, 
wishing to put self in the place of God. Their shame arises when they become enemies of one another through the war for dominance on the part of each. By the way, um, nobody will tell you this before marriage, but think of Chesterton's definition of a married couple. There's a four-legged animal with one will. And it's really a really good idea for the fellow to figure out who that is very quick. <laughs> I mean, in principle, a man must have the last word in every argument, every discussion. But in all wisdom, it better be, yes, dear. And the sooner you learn that, the happier the marriage will be. Their sexed individuality was given Adam and Eve so that in becoming one, they might heal their essential incompleteness and come into existence as the one essence God intended from the beginning. By willing the good of the other, that is, by self-giving love, male and female become one in spirit, will, and truth. That gift comes not solely from one unrequited. The gift of one is matched by the gift of the other. Freely given, their love is mutual. As I mentioned yesterday, it's important to experience unrequited love in which you love someone who does not love you in return. It, it's not necessary, but it's helpful because then you really appreciate the gift that is the love from another. It doesn't have to be. And it's just extraordinary when it happens. When I asked to marry my wife, after waiting a year and thinking carefully about the timing and not quite getting it right, uh, I knelt down in front of the chair where she was. It was a Sunday, it was Easter Sunday, actually. She was reading the New York Times. Or no, she had it laid out across her lap, but under the armchair in my apartment. And I, and I no sooner concluded than she said, oh, Michael, couldn't you wait just a little bit longer? I wasn't too surprised by that because that's the way she was. Um, and uh, we were always late. And um, <laughs> so I said, with unusual calm for me, I said, uh, OK, Karen, I just want to make you two promises. First, I'm going to ask you the same question in September. And the rest of the summer, I'm going back to Rome to work on my second novel. So the summer before I went to Rome for the, for the same reason, um, um, and I wrote her 104 letters from April 1st to September 1st. And she, promising that she doesn't write letters, and I shouldn't expect them, wrote back 54, which I thought was a pretty decent start. And, uh, and um, anyway, um, so I walked into the other room, and I, I had a book review I had to write that afternoon for Commonweal. I think it was The Four Loves, as a matter of fact, C.S. Lewis's book, which Karen hated. And uh, she hated the C.S. Lewis comparison of marriage to having an old shoe and a comfortable chair. She said, Michael, I am not going to be an old shoe. <laughs> Just forget it. <laughs> and, and, uh, OK. So I'm sitting, and then I, I type about a page. I get down there partway through the review, and all of a sudden she walks in in stocking feet and pushes me back from my typewriter, sits in my lap, puts her arm up on my neck. And she says, Michael, maybe we ought to get married now. And then she pushed back and she said, I started thinking about all those Italian girls. <laughs> 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 and 
and since she had read my letters from the summer before, I told her about every one of them that I met. <laughs> and, and, uh, okay. Their sexed individuality was given Adam and Eve so that in becoming one, they might heal their essential incompleteness and come into existence as the one essence God intended from the beginning. By willing the good of the other, that is, by self-giving love, male and female become one in spirit, will, and truth. That gift comes not solely from one unrequited, but the gift of the one is matched by the gift of the other. Okay. To speak of Adam and Eve in their communion is to capture their gift to, of each to each. Their being comes to rest in one another. Thus, however imperfectly, our sexuality reveals to us that Whatever else he might be like, our creator lives in self-giving communion. This experience of communion between woman and man, often unspoken and, and given more as a sharing, often silent, um, um, this experience of communion between woman and man, self-giving and mutuality, and without either's dominance, is more like the inner life of God than anything else that we encounter in creation. Now try to think in this world, what is the most divine thing you've experienced? What is the most godlike? What is the highest form of experience you have? And almost certainly, as a human being, in or outside of marriage, you will say love. Um, there's nothing surpasses it. And so, you know, if you think, what does that say about God if we're made in his image? Well, there is a relation between the Trinity, the communion of persons, and the married couple. To self-giving communion, in which each wills wholly the good of the other as other, giving of self freely and in accord with the creative will of the creator, nothing else in the experience of the race comes close to being most divine. Now, one other thing I want to reflect on just a moment. It's Thomas Aquinas who gives that very powerful definition. To love is to will the good of the other as other. Boy, that's a hard one. Is she ever other? I mean, let me just tell you. Uh, you marry a woman, you marry a mystery. She doesn't even understand herself. Karen, why are you crying? What did I do? I don't know. Just let me cry. <laughs> okay. Uh, you get used to it. <laughs> and, uh, a man has to love a woman a lot and not worry if he doesn't understand. It's perfectly all right. Um, okay. Boitia's views on sex reflect the riches of the Catholic tradition, erotic, poetic, profound. In two of the deepest, most lovely lines in the history of any language, Dante captures the essence of this love and all its range. T.S. Lewis says these are the most beautiful lines in all human poetry. And the old Italian, you know, Rocco must correct me, but in la sua volontà e nostra pace. Um, and Eliot particularly loved that little soft sound between volontà e, e, e nostra pace. Just trips off and then picks up with the E at the end. Uh, and then secondly, uh, l'amor 
que move el sol en otra estela. The love that moves the sun and all the stars. Propelled by its most divine-like energies, l'amour is sexual, erotic, physical, and in that form, its communio is procreative. From two in one, there comes a third. From the love of two, there comes the miraculous and startling creativity of birthing, pushing forth a newborn child, not just child, but girl or boy. No one's born a person. They're born a sexed and gendered person. Consider the relation of Wojtyla to Aquinas. Thomas Gilby once said of Aquinas that he paid things in the act of rendering them in their complexity the compliment of attempting to do so without breaking into poetry. What a lovely line. Aquinas paid things, rendering them in their due complexity, the compliment of not breaking into poetry. But it does come awfully close. Gilby himself writes a paragraph putting together a miscellany of Aquinas's texts on love. Aquinas may not have broken into poetry, but did not fall short by much. Love is more unitive than knowledge in seeking the thing, not the thing's reason. It's bent is to a real union. Love's bent is to a real union. Other effects of love, Aquinas also enumerates. A reciprocal abiding, mutua inhesio, adhesion. Of lover and beloved together as one. A transport, ex tasis, to stand out from nothingness stand out from, to be outside of. I wouldn't count on that too much. Hemingway writes that uh, in a whole lifetime, there are only three occasions when love is such as to move the world, the ecstasy. That's not the ordinary experience, but it happens. A transport out of the self to the other, an ardent cherishing zealous of another, a melting liquefaxio, so that the heart is unfrozen and open to be entered, a longing in absence, long war, heat in pursuit, fervor, and enjoyment in presence, fruitio. In delight, too, there is an all at once wholeness and timelessness that reflect a total simu of eternity. You know, eternity is not a very long time. Forgive me for saying elementary things, but it's not a long time. Eternity is everything all cupped up in one. It's like, um, I remember as I love to play football and touch football and and um, I remember often at play, hearing dimly and then gradually becoming more conscious. My mother calling me for dinner, and I thought that's impossible. We just started. You'd be so wrapped up in the tending to each play that time would just elapse. Well, eternity is like that. It's, it's all cupped up in one, like a handful of water, so to speak. Um, an edge of sadness, similar to that of the gift of knowledge. An expansion of spirit. A complete fulfillment of activity without satiety. For they drink they that drink shall yet thirst. So it's 
The fullness of that love is the fullness of activity. Yet you're not bored with it. You're not sated by it. Now Wojtyla too is a poet, but he grew up under Nazi occupation and was driven to deeper depths by the knowledge of sheer terror and the need for steely will. Uh, I heard somewhere, and I'd like to ask Rocco's view on this, that the roots of Wojtyla's later rejection of Shaler occurred when he was exiting, I think he was 16, quite young, exiting from Babel Cathedral, where he had just served mass for a priest. And Babel Cathedral was built above the river. And as he was running down the winding, walking down the winding path, German stukas suddenly descended and the invasion had begun. And they were strafing and bombing across the river. That's where his father's house was. His father was already elderly, and he, he ran in panic, and his, his, his breath was hot. His lungs were burning from the intensity of running to get there. And he felt this terrible, terrible cold fear, you know, before which he was powerless. I mean, what could you do against dive bombers? And then again, when he joined in the rhapsodic theater with his friends, keeping alive the Polish stage, the Polish theater. And just in that way, keeping in living practice the culture of Poland. Um, and he realized that any night they might be broken in on. People had to come to this after all. It had to be known around. And throw them into concentration camps. So he knew that you have to have more than emotions, more than sympathy to do ethical things. You could feel like the bottom of a birdcage. You could dread what you're about to do. You could have cold fear running through you. All your emotions were against it, but you could do it. You could will to do it. And uh, OK, I've just filed that at the back of your head. I think it's, a, I think it's if it's true, se non è vero e ben trovato, as the Italians say. If it's not true, it deserved to have been invented. Um, but uh, but it gives a nice nice insight into the terror he learned and the need to act despite the terror, which goes a bit beyond the notion that our feelings give us our best clues. Feelings do give you wonderful clues. Sometimes your mind rationalizes its way to yes when something in you says no, and sometimes that feeling is correct. But there are other times when feelings are, are irrelevant. And you discover what one thing uh, Goitia appreciated in Aquinas was discovering the theory of will, the will to do despite your feelings. OK. Um, when all around his friends were being brutalized, dehumanized, and exterminated, with ruthlessly systemic purpose, the communion of subjects came to seem to him more rare and precious. He hardly knew who to trust, who to talk to. It's one of the worst things communism did is destroy trust. Even in families, you had to be very careful with your children, lest they say something in school about going to church, which could cause you to lose your job. Imagine how destructive that must be in a family. Um, it was to that interiority of the human subject that events drove him. Love is more unitive than knowledge in seeking the thing. Unitive, seeking the thing, not the thing's reason. Wojtyla would write subject in the place of thing. Love is more unitive than knowledge in seeking the subject, the other subject, not the subject's reason, not, not analyzing it, but 
seeking unity with it. Rigorously, he would take Aquinas and drive every term of his analysis inward toward the subject and toward that communio in which the two subjects fuse as one. In other words, uh, Boiti had an especial, he was a poet, and he had a special sensitivity to experience and the experience from which words arise and which force you to make a distinction you otherwise wouldn't make. In a, in a certain sense, intellect follows. Um, okay, the only trustworthy path experience had shown the young Wojtyla is self-donating will, willing the good of the other no matter how one feels. Under terror, one's own feelings cannot at all times be trusted. For the young priest and later pope, even celibacy is understood in the light of matrimony, the sacrament by which the creator revealed to humankind the communio of his own nature. Thus, the second part of the pope's meditations, begun in 1980, concerns the trick question the Sadducees put to Jesus. If a woman were married, and widowed seven times, with which husband should she be joined in paradise? Jesus answered that the Sadducees misapprehended paradise. It is not that humans there are bodiless, but that communio comes to the fore. Communion with the love that moves the sun and other stars, in whose will is peace the unity with God that constitutes paradise is to will the good of the other, to be one with God's own love for all. That is the love that inflames the person who commits his life for that kingdom of heaven's sake to celibacy. He wills totally the will of God in himself and for all humankind. His communio does not falsify it vindicates the love that a man offers to a woman, a woman to a man, in total self-givingness. The two kinds of love, matrimonial and celibate, shed a kind of light upon each other. Matrimony reminds us of the earthiness of the human city, breathed upon by God's love, and of the completed united two-ness of our essential nature. And I'm gonna repeat, G.K. Chesterton was being more than merely witty when he defined the married couple as a four-legged animal inflamed with love and led by one will. But celibacy dramatizes for us that the source of unity of love is the total giving of two wills focused in the good of the other. Celibacy is no denial of the body, only a leapfrog over to the gift of will for the creator and redeemer's use. Married and celibate each teach each other depths of love. In this perspective, the Pope thoroughly refresh, refashioned the standpoint of Humanae Vitae. Instead of visualizing the moral task of married in married love as a kind of endurance, the Pope asks, how can married love grow into the fullness of human nature in its highest possibilities for self-giving love? Instead of focusing on birth control, the Pope turns to the first of the cardinal virtues, practical wisdom, prudentia, phronesis, and speaks of the excellence of prudence in deciding in God's presence how many children to have, how to regulate fertility. Practical experience teaches a couple that they will need to practice abstinence at times, no matter what. They will need to practice abstinence. Just as they at times enjoy ecstasy. Not so often, but they do. And the tension of that drama is a large part of human excellence. Prudence, temperance, justice, courage, excellence in all four cardinal virtues heightens excellence in married life. You know, you're basically marrying the other person for her virtues. My wife sometimes, in the midst of heavy petting, would push back from me and say, 
Michael, you marry me for my mind, right? So I would lie. <laughs> but the truth is, I did. I mean, you don't make love with a body. You make love with someone's sense of humor that you love and their insights and their capacity for suffering and the rest. Um, so you do marry for the mind, the way the mind infuses the body. Now, it's also one other thing. You have to reteach yourself about all this because we, we imagine this long for a thousand years now. We tend to think we are a will inhabiting a body. We make ourselves do things, like the ghost in the machine, the, um, Plato's image of, of the soul being trapped in the body and chained in the body and needing to break loose. And that's not it at all. Um, it, it's wrong to look at, you, the, in a certain perspective it's right, but in a deeper way it's wrong to look, there's my hand out there. That's not quite right. You're in your hand. Your soul is in your hand. In Karen's case it was visibly true. She was an artist. And her great talent was in drawing. I mean, she could look at something without even looking at the paper and so on and, and draw it. it. It was there in her fingers, the talent. And uh, OK, so it's wrong to think, there's my hand. No, it's not. It's the soul all the way through. Um, and it's a little bit hard. To, we have to readjust after Descartes. Uh, the way we think about mind and body, not thinking of them separate, but mutually infusing one another. And Karen was the most remarkable person I ever met for her sense of the unity of body and soul. I mean, I don't think I'll be revealing too much as long as this isn't shown in Cresco, Iowa. Uh, uh, if I say there was a certain amount of tension between her and her mother and father. That's not rare, is it? Uh, and um, sometimes it would reach such an extreme point, the tension, that should break out in bronchitis. And the minute we'd leave, the bronchitis would start to leave too. <laughs> I, I never saw anything like that. But what her spirit felt her body expressed very quickly in the reverse. By the way, I think that's one reason why the predominance of those interested in the theology of the body are women. As far as I can tell, almost all the groups I see studying theology of the body are majority women. And I, I think that's because women live so much closer to their bodies. And their bodies force them to be much more aware of body than a male. A male has to learn to disregard his body, just press on. Uh, that's not a woman's experience, it seems to me. Um, instead of asking, what am I forbidden to do, the moral inquiry ought to ask, how do we shape our lives of sexual love in ways that fulfill our dignity? The Pope suggests that married couples regard sexual love in marriage as a school, always bringing out in them new excellences and bringing them deeper into participation in God's own love within them. Uh, something never, nobody has ever spoken about that I know of or written about, except the Pope hints at it, is um, How many moral, no, that's not right. How many spiritual lessons married love, physical love, teaches you? It's very hard to learn the rhythm of each other's bodies. And it's not enough to say male and female. People are very different, have very different experiences. And to put yourself on the same timing as the other person. And to be aware of each other's feelings is quite a discipline. You don't get it all at once. You know a lot more about it when you're older than you did when you were younger. And uh, so there, there's an asceticism in sexual love itself. 
there are lessons in spirituality there that are very profound. And you hope that over a married life, I, I don't know if I said yesterday, but I meant to, that the day you're married, you're not married, you're just starting. I mean, it's a journey, and you'll be much more married if you're lucky and it's done if you're blessed uh, two years later than, that, than at the wedding, and 10 years later than at two years after, and 20 years, and so forth. Uh, becoming, and it's a matter of becoming one. You're given oneness sim symbolically immediately. But to li live into it, it takes time. Okay, but uh, the point I want to make is the asceticism of sexual life. It's really, it really teaches you a lot of discipline of a kind you didn't expect. Um, how am I doing on time? Okay. Uh, four things are novel in Wojtyla's thought on love and responsibility to allude to a title of another of his books. First, there is the turn to interiority, to subjectivity, beyond the Thomistic synthesis. He could not have done this without the experience of modernity and the simultaneous turn of some phenomenologists to both the subject and the real. Now, my way of thinking about this, and I, I may have learned it from somebody, I may have it all wrong, but anyway, if you imagine the ideologies flying like hand grenades in Europe, in European consciousness, communism, Nazism, fascism, liberalism, all these isms, Europeans live in a blizzard of isms. Um, and, um, and they all prove false. So what's real? What X says, or Y says, or B says, or A says, what's real? And that becomes, as they like to say, an existential question. Who am I? And that's why I think the search for the subject, at least no matter what happens, you can know I feel the sun on my arm. Like the girl in the blue raincoat, I've met somebody with a sense of humor and uh, kindness. Um, um, that I know. And if I block out other things and just build from that, how far can I go in constructing a sense of what is really real, not what's ideology? How close can I come to it? Okay. So that's what I mean by the experience of modernity, particularly in the 20th century, and the rush to be accurate about the human subject. To answer Socrates' question, or fulfill his imperative, know thyself. It turns out that's not so easy. Just like Jesus' imperative, love your neighbor as yourself. The wrinkle in that, the curveball in that, is it's so hard to love yourself. And we tend to lash out at others because we don't love ourselves. Um, and it's a great help to have someone love you. It's almost unbelievable. Um, OK. Second is the refusal to separate the person from its body. Wojtyla refuses to adopt a physicalist theory of sexual love. He refuses to be a manichae. He refuses to be a Gnostic. He loves the human body has always enjoyed his own strength and vitality, climbing in the mountains, kayaking in mountain waters, until an assassin's bullet and other maladies made him bear the cross of his own body's infirmities. He loves the sights and smells and sounds of the liturgy at the Holy Mass. He loves the oils of the sacraments. Everywhere he sees the ways that spirit and body are made for one another, enter into one another, and to penetrate in the secret recesses of our being, embodied selves indeed. Thus do we believe in the, in the resurrection of the embodied self. The third insight is that the unity of man and woman comes in the giving of the will, each to each. 
the giving of the self makes truthful the bodies being one, and the bodies being one express united selves. The heart of love is communio of selves. In matrimony, human selves are one in both their bodies and their selves. Now, one, one thing about that, too, is that uh, the, the wrinkle in what Aquinas says, love is willing the good of the other as other. The trick in that is she has a view of her good, and you have a view of her good, and then there's the real good for her, which neither of you quite see. So you're playing with six variables, if you can see what I mean. It's part of what makes it so complicated. You're playing with his and hers sense of their own good, and of the hers view of his good, which is usually different, usually requires change. A woman always tends to think that after marriage, her husband is going to change, and he seldom does. A man always thinks that after marriage, his wife is, will never change, and she always does, and very quickly, actually. <laughs> uh, the girl you marry is not the girl you courted. Um, I'm teasing, but there's a certain truth in it. Okay. Uh, uh, so uh, the giving of a will, willing the good of the other as other, gosh, a woman is not another man, alas. No, no, <laughs> thank God. But, <laughs> but uh, figuring out what's her good, you know, anyway, is hard, as other. It's the otherness that's so wonderful. I mean, she is not bent to your will. And boy, will she make it plain. Um, she's other. And, um, and willing that good is, is love. OK. The fourth insight is that our sexualities are, that in our sexuality lie the glimpses of the Godhead. Our vision of God becomes clearest when our minds grasp the communion of persons in matrimony. Marriage between man and woman is the most beautiful, as Aquinas puts it, of all friendships, all the friendships known to us. God is more like the communion of persons than he is like any other thing we know of. That, at least, is the way he has revealed himself to us, not only in scripture and in his son, but also in the way our embodied selves are joined in matrimony. At the very head of the book, it is written, male and female, he made them from the beginning. He made them in his image. Should we miss the point of that, it's hard to believe we'd met, get much right about the rest of the Bible. Right up there at the beginning, male and female, he made them. In his image, he made them. There's something about the relation of man and woman that reveals something about God's nature and the nature of communio. Okay. For some time, Western culture has been in the fever of free love and contraception. In fact, there was a positive, aggressive war on the part of Marx, Engels, and other early communist thinkers, ideologists, ideologists to destroy marriage. Because marriage is the one truth-giving institution. You live so close to one another that you really can't bear each other's illusions too long. I mean, you know, for the first four months or so, you're very sweet to one another and appreciative. And then you gradually start mentioning the things that really irritate you and that are changeable. Um, well, that's the way it ought to be. Marriage is the one truth-bearing institution left to us in which people live so close that they can't bear each other's illusions about themselves. Um, OK. Um, but communists wanted to destroy marriage and preach free love. And, and that war is still going on. And now not under communist auspices, under liberal auspices, it's, it's wrecking enormous havoc in our lives. Uh,
free love. And shacking up, we used to call it. Hooking up, it now is. Better than marriage. But that project must not be going very well. Why else would there be so many books on sex, so many manuals, so many grapplings to understand the widespread disappointment? But just wait. Boredom is as boredom does. Disordered sexual love and death are partners in a deathly dance. There will come a time when minds are open, when women and men begin to wonder. When he wrote Eros into our embodied selves, what did God intend? Then it may be that they will not find many gods as daring as Carol Wojtyla, and realize, recognize by comparison, what thin gruel progressive ideology provides. It's no wonder which side should win out. I don't say will win out, but should win out. Thank you.